Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about an idea that I think everyone will enjoy, and that's what is a short circuit study and why are they important? And to help us walk through this idea is going to be Mr. Kareen Josephs, who is the lead power systems engineer at Eaton. Welcome, Kareen. Hey, how are you doing, Chris? Doing good. Looking forward to this discussion. And I, I know you can maybe help us get us started by explaining what a short circuit study is. Sure. A short circuit study is basically an analysis of the protective devices of one's electrical system. Protective devices are generally circuit breakers, fuses, fuse switches, any device meant to protect equipment and or isolate short circuits. Okay. Very good. So we love to talk on this podcast about the why, you know, why are things important? So if you were to have to run into somebody in a hallway and they stop you and they, they want to, hey, why is a short circuit study important? What would be the answer? So uh, I think the why would be a short circuit study is really needed to ensure that during a fault or also known as a short circuit, that the protective devices are not subject to current levels and mechanical forces greater than they were designed to withstand. And thus, one, will not open to explode or three, some other undesired results. So I would say the most important thing is to ensure that you're operating within the manufacturer's parameters for that device. Okay. Now let's say I've decided that that's important to me. I'm in my industrial plant and yes, I want to understand a short circuit study and what, you know, what risks are associated with it. So what type of information do I need to get that study done? So in order to perform a short circuit study, uh, you need protective device manufacturer's data uh, and also the available maximum current to that protective device or that protective device will experience during that fault. You know, today we use intelligent transient analysis software such as ETAP, Easy Power, SKM to help automate the process and cut down on time. However, in my opinion, it's still very important that the engineer performing the study know what the program is doing to help spot any potential errors or unreasonable values when they're performing this study. Okay, so that that information from the manufacturer standpoint, as the end user and the owner of the equipment, that's my responsibility to gather that prior, correct? That's correct. If you're doing it by hand, then yes. I mean, you would have to get the breaker data, but all of that's readily available right now. I mean, you can go to, for instance, if you're using say, uh, cut with hammer breakers, all that's available on the website for free. You could get the manufacturer data for that. But more importantly, today, you know, utilizing one of this, these uh, types of software like ETAP or SCAM, as I mentioned a little while ago, all of that information is generally contained within the libraries that are already there. And so you don't really have to go and get this data per se. It's already there in the library. So it makes it a whole lot easier than we used to do back in the day by hand when we had to go and actually ascertain, obtain all this data. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to get it uh, in 2020. <laughs> definitely. It definitely sounds that way. I mean, and maybe we'll try to, to link that. You, know, you mentioned ETAP, Easy Powers, SKM, some of those resources for, for people if they want to check that out further. And, you know, a lot of times when it comes to services, you know how it is, you got to have something tangible. So what typically comes back when you have this type of study done? Got you. So basically what typically comes back is a comparison between the available fault current and the protective device capability, commonly known as protective device duty. And what that basically means is the comparison between what the manufacturer ratings for this protective device how does it compare to the amount of fault current that I currently have in my system? And it's, it's a snapshot in time. And so, you know, I've got X amount of motors, a feminine equivalent short circuit current from the utility coming in, the combined sum of that short circuit current, how does that compare to the device that I'm using to basically interrupt that short circuit or that fault current? So you know, what comes back generally is a comparison between the two, and, you know, we're able to then tell whether or not your device 
is rated properly for the amount or the available short circuit that you have. Okay. Now, say I got that report back and I, and I had this great information in front of me. So maybe what what are some first steps I should do with that to actually get the bang for the buck, if you will? Yeah. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go through and ensure that all your protective devices are rated or actually none of them are overrated, put it that way. You know, the first time you see a protective device overrated, that should be a flag that needs to be highlighted. And at some point, provisions made to replace that device. Those are some of the things that you really want to make sure that you pay attention to. Because like I said, the devices that are overduty, you don't know what, how they're going to respond. They could, one, not open. They could explode in your face if you subject that protective device to an overduty type uh, uh, configuration or anything else. They could do one of the two, uh, not open, explode, just sit there. So there's a lot of different reasons that you want to make sure that, you know, you know devices are, are operating. Now, typically with those with those reports and when they come back, is it ranked so far as I, from a priority standpoint of, hey, if you, you really need to concentrate here versus there? I mean, is it kind of help a user break down, you know, where the highest risk is? Yeah. So I can tell you that the short circuit reports that we do at Eaton, basically that information would be contained within the executive summary. And we would go in and say, you know, breaker. 5.3J is overduty by X amount of percent, and it would be highlighted in red, and we would flag it in the executive summary such that the user, the end user, would have the information there in a, a page or so. You know, go look at this breaker, this breaker, this board, whatever. This has been flagged as overduty, so it would be very easy to go and, you know, make those changes. That's great. I mean, I was hoping that would be the case, but you just never know. So I, I like, definitely like to ask. Now, one thing that comes up a lot of time, we've talked about this on a couple episodes of Eco Asks Why, is are one lines or single lines because I don't want to offend anyone. So <laughs> do you need to have a one line to, to get a short circuit study done? So uh, <laughs> one line or single line are interchangeable. Uh, you know, the, the academic world calls it a single line. I mean, you know, I've heard one line. At the end of the day, it's basically one phase of a three-phase balance system that you're looking at. And uh, I mean, a three-line does exist as well when you're looking at like CT connections or other things. But as far as for the purpose of a short circuit, uh, ultimately, if one hasn't been created, the engineer performing the study will will create one uh, either by hand or by modeling the bulk electrical system or the or the circuit that is being analyzed. And, you know, the one line will kind of need to show how the circuit is connected and really dictate the end feed back into the buses or through the protective devices. So, I mean, you will need to know what the power flow looks like and how the circuit is electrically connected to be able to uh, to calculate whether by hand or you would have to model it accordingly in the transit software, you know, either either or to be able to effectively perform short circuit. So yes, the answer is you would need some type of one line configured to be able to run an analysis uh, for short circuit. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that, that helps answer that. Thank you so much. And, you know, one thing we also often hear with these different types of studies is, you know, the cadence and the frequency, how often. So what would be the answer to that for a short circuit study? So, so my recommendation for short circuit study uh, and you know, based on experience uh, has been that I would recommend a short circuit study be completed at least every five years due primarily to the changing utility demand. The majority of your fault current in any system is going to come through the utility. There is some percentage of the or smaller percentage of the, the, uh, the contribution that's going to come through motors turn synchronous generators and so forth during a you know during a fault but the the overwhelming majority of the fault current will come through the utility and as new factories get put in place as utility demands change the feminine short circuit values increase over time and so you know when they increase obviously the amount of short circuit into the system increases as well. And so for that reason, it's kind of recommended three to five years, I'd say five years being the maximum to have a short circuit done. That's, that's probably the general 
answer to your question. The other answer would be, it kind of depends on how much of an upgrade you're doing and how frequently you're upgrading your system. If you're putting in, you know, a lot of 50 horsepower motors or, you know, motors greater than 50 horsepower, a lot of motors that could contribute back into the system, then, you know, maybe five years is too long. Maybe every year or two, it kind of just depends on how much or how frequent major equipment is being added to the system. Okay. Now, that was a, a great, great answer there. It gives us a, a perception of, you know, the frequency and then also the other considerations, you know, when your system changes, because you're right. It, if nothing changes in three years, you may be okay going to five, but if you added equipment or taking things away, that may be a, a, a prime time to, to do that analysis again. Exactly. Now, from a, from an operation standpoint in a, in a facility, who do you see as typically the owner of, you know, coordinating and managing a short circuit study? Sure. So typically in my, my previous life in the utility world, it was usually like the plant engineer. Each, each plant had their own engineer, system engineer, and that individual or, or team of individuals were responsible for um, managing short circuit constraints, making sure that, you know, protective devices were not over duty, making sure that consultants, when they did the, uh, the studies or the calculations, we call them, that any, any, any breakers flagged as over duty would be, would be replaced as quickly as possible and so forth. In the industrial world, I've seen more of a maintenance supervisor, a maintenance engineer, and sometimes even safety directors. I've seen, I, I had a customer with three different plants where the safety director actually was in charge of ensuring that, you know, the protective devices were, uh, you know, were all properly maintained and anything that was over duty was, was swiftly replaced. Really? So the safety director and some, yes. okay. Wow. Typically I would have thought more that, that electrical E and I, you know, yeah. roles. Okay. Very good. So, let, let's say you have some equipment that you, have you, you've mentioned this term a few times, over in that short circuit study, and it comes back and it shows that. Where do they start from, from a remediation standpoint? So from a remediation standpoint, I mean, it's, it's basically pretty simple math. So, you know, you've got a breaker that is rated at 14 kiloamps, short circuit symmetrical or interrupting 14 kA. And, you know, when that piece of equipment was put in and the, the initial study was done that say the you know the engineer did the study came back there was only eight ka of fault current kill amps or eight thousand amps of fault current well as the utility uh increases and grows short circuit becomes more and more as more motors are in place and you know designed and put in place and the capacity the loading capacity increases that short circuit now you know goes up from 8KA to 10KA, 12KA, 15KA. Now, now, you know, bear in mind that protective device is a static protective device. That 14KA is what it was manufactured at. It is not dynamic. It does not change. Even though the short circuit values are dynamic, the, the, the available fault current into a system is dynamic. And so as it increases, as that available fault current increases, and that protective device is static, there becomes a point where it surpasses the amount of allowable fault current that that device can withstand. And so that's what happens over time. We go into these plants and, you know, when they put this system in eight years ago, it was perfectly fine. But now, you know, you're at almost twice the amount of fault current that this protective device or this entire board can withstand. And so at that point, really, the, the the best thing to do is look at either replacing that overduty piece of equipment. You know, the breakers themselves can be retrofitted with breakers that have a higher capacity for, for short circuit currents. But in addition to just the breakers, you also have to look at the bus, you know, to make sure that the bus bracing is capable of doing that as well. So we have a group that goes out and does bus bracing calculations as well. And they can say, okay, yes, you can replace this to a 35 K breaker and your bus is actually properly braced for up to 42 K. So all you have to do is, you know, pull out the 14 K breakers and put in the new 35 K breakers. And that will get you, that'll hump you along 
for the next couple of years, uh, at some point, eventually you will exceed or the amount of fault current will exceed what the bus bracing capability is. And at that point, you'll either have to have it rebraced, the equipment rebraced or replaced. And so those are some of the things that we see frequently, you know, when we go out to different plants, it's, it's just an evolution of people adding more over time. No doubt. Absolutely. That was a great answer, Kareem. And thank you for walking through that. We love, we love on eco why to get to the why. And, you know, and I think there's a component of safety with the short circuit study that, that probably is a big driver in the purpose. So if, you know, if you were to kind of break down the why, the benefits, you know, on why our listeners should go and, and really consider a short circuit study, what would that be? Um, so, you know, we're not, we're not really talking here about art flash, but art flash is probably one of the most important phenomenons that we've, we've looked at of modern times. And the short circuit or the device's capability to clear the fault is paramount to art flash. You know, if, if I can't depend on the breaker to trip and clear the fault at a certain time, then the art flash study kind of goes out the door. And so, you know, when we go into that's, that's kind of why we do art flash and short circuit together. Not only do we go and do an art flash or instant energy calculation to determine the, the hazard risk of art flash, but we also look at the components to make sure that they will properly operate. And when we tell a customer, Hey, you know, this, if there's a fault on this bus here, this protective device upstream will clear in X amount of seconds for, you know, this magnitude of fault current. If the breaker is operating properly, has been maintenance properly and is operating within the parameters, then you can, you, you, mean, you can safely assume that the, you know, the arc will be extinguished and that the fault current will dissipate and the breaker will open. And so from a safety standpoint, it's extremely important to have the equipment that works that's been properly maintenance equipment that will clear a fault current or inadvertent fault current during that time. Very good. Very good. I mean, all important things. And and I'm so glad that you were able to tie that safety component in for, for those that are out there and they're wondering, you know, that that's such a big driver. So Kareem, uh, thank you so much. You've really unpacked a lot of information for our listeners on a short circuit study, why they're important. And I, I know that, uh, you know, the, the value you brought out there today that uh, is greatly appreciated. So thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 